All right, so what we'll do is, Mikey, you're going to come. You had the first question. Barry, you have two minutes to respond. At the end of your two minutes, you will give Micah a question. We'll have two minutes. We'll, we'll shoot this out to your questions play out for the topic at hand. What is the condition of man? Three questions maximum. You know, you can have one, three, uh, three. Um, yes, sir. I'm going to try to read you all over yeah. right now after you've got to take it home. Questions. It's Barry's, so I don't know when you can get it up. This is Barry's camera. Would that be better? Yeah, why, why don't you ask it and then he's going to come because they need to hear it they can't hear it if you're sitting there i don't know oh i got you yeah okay they want me to come up here they want to ask the questions oh, okay, okay i got you okay so you sit down then you'll sit down and you're good you're good okay ready for your question okay uh, uh, very very used uh, uh psalm 58 3 about babies uh, speaking lies from the womb. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know that babies uh, were capable of speaking languages right if they come out of the womb. But I would like, I would like Barry to uh, comment and uh, reconcile Isaiah, uh, Psalm 58.3 with Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 39, and Isaiah 7.16 which says, before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, moreover in that day when your little ones, which having no knowledge of good or evil. I quote it. <laughs> well, does God contradict himself? That's the question. Does God contradict himself? Which one's true? It wasn't the question. Well, that's the implication. Either Deuteronomy is true, if we're, if we're framing it like this, that the little ones can know no evil, or Psalms 58 is true, that they come forth from the womb telling lies. And obviously the implication is that once they get to the point where they can practice sin. So are we, do we have a contradiction in Scripture? How do we rectify it? Do we strike out the one we don't like and keep the one we do like? Or do we have to apply some type of reasoning? How is it that the little ones do not know evil? And I apologize because in 10 seconds I can't look at the text to find the context. Well, Barry, I don't have a problem with you looking at it. I'm sorry. No, it's my fault for not having the time, so it's not you. I'm not educating you. I don't have the time to look at Deuteronomy 1, so I'm going to have to place a logical answer. I have to accept both as true. I have to accept that man is born in dead trespasses and sin, Ephesians 1. I have to accept that there is none righteous, none good, Romans 3. I have to accept that Psalms 58. So obviously the only conclusion I can come to without looking at the context as best as I can, it must be experientially that they have not yet experienced evil. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's correct. No, it's my fault. It's my fault. Uh, I'll ask, a, I'm going to just stick with a logical question because uh, that's all I have. If there is no original sin, then the mere odds alone dictate that half the people in the world would not sin. So how do we square that with Romans that tells us that there are none righteousness, and with your own words in an interview, which you said, if I'm not mistaken, that there would be more people going to heaven than hell. And you can correct me if I'm wrong. Huh? You said that, that hell, more people would go to hell yeah. than heaven. So how do we rectify that with the fact that there's no original sin? Because mere odds would dictate half would never sin. Well, man is, man is not born guilty. Man is not born sinful. Man is born innocent. The, the word original sin can be very much a semantical issue depending on how you define sin. But as I pointed out, uh, I maintain babies are not born holy. Babies are born innocent. They have no knowledge of good and evil. You cannot be held accountable for committing sin until you know right from wrong. The sin, about 1 John 3, 4, whosoever commits sin transgresses also law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Uh, Romans 14, 23, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. The, uh, James 4, 17, therefore him that knows to do good and doeth it not to him is sin. John 8, 34, uh, John 8, 34 Jesus said, whosoever commits sin is a servant of sin. 1 John 3, he that commits sin is of the devil. Sin is always a voluntary act of transgressing God's known will or law. 
based on the definition to us given in the scripture. Before, uh, um, Deuteronomy 139, your little ones, which in that day had no knowledge, not just of evil, but of good or evil. So they're born innocent. Okay, my question is, if it's impossible for sinners to change, or if they play no part uh, in change, why does God constantly command us to change our heart and repent? Well, I would not say it's impossible. I would say it's impossible without the grace of God. And I think that's the key point. We're not talking about a man reforming his ways and on his own power doing good. Also, the implications of God is that you shall not lie. Now, is that the will of God that you shall not lie? And you shall not steal and you shall not kill. So then, what's going on daily? Lying, stealing, killing. That's happening daily. So is that that God is giving a commandment that people cannot obey? Well, I would say absolutely in the power of their own selves, they cannot obey. And the vast majority of the fact that all are lost, that there are none righteous, that yes, God has expressed his moral law. What does Galatians say? But the purpose of the law was to be our schoolmasters so that we might come to Christ and be saved by grace. The purpose of the law was not to reform ourselves. It's been said that the law is like a mirror. We look at the law to see our condition in order to see our need for what? Reformation? No, Christ. That's why we preach Christ and Him crucified. Not moral reformation. That's my question. Uh, 1 John 1.18. It's an epistle. It's written to the church. It's written to believers. 1 John has no verse 18. 1.8. Thank you, sir. 1 okay. John 1.8. Please forgive me. Uh, 1 John 1 8. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. John is speaking to the church. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. I would ask Micah, are you completely, totally, right now, perfectly holy and without sin? And if so, how do you explain 1 John 1 8, 1 through 10, that says believers are sinners? It's not what it says. It says in uh, John 9, 31, says, Now we know that God hears not sinners. 1 Peter 4, 18 says, If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? 1 Peter 3, 12 says, The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayer. So God makes a distinction between the righteous and the sinner. He doesn't hear the prayer of the sinner. He does hear the prayer of the righteous. So that, that's not what the, the verse said. But I'll put it in context. 1 John 1, 5 said, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. What is walking in darkness? Is that walking in disobedience? Is that walking in sin? Is that walking outside of the truth that God reveals to us? So, does 1 John 1, 6 contradict 1 John 1, 8? Does the Bible contradict itself, or are we taking something out of context? The next verse says, if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. How can you walk in light and darks at the same time? Why would God command you to walk in the light if it's impossible? <laughs> If, if you walk in the light, then the blood of Jesus Christ's Son cleanses you from all sin. But now, you know, verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If you're in sin, don't deceive yourself and say you're not. Go to verse 9, if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the rest of the chapter, 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these things are on you, sin not. 1 John 3, 6, whosoever abideth in him, sin not. 1 John 3, 9, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. 1 John 5, 18, whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Okay. Is, uh, is the suppressing the truth that Romans 1, 18 talks about? 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth or suppress the truth or, or uh, hold back the truth and unrighteousness. Is that voluntary or involuntary? And the answer is yes. Am I being funny? No. Does man have a free will? Well, certainly man has a will. He has a will to sin as much as he likes. The problem is not a will. The problem is his nature. The Romans 1 is still the Romans. The person in Romans 1 who suppresses sin and suppresses the knowledge of God is the same person in Romans 3 who is none righteous. The issue is that he's a pig. And we can take him out of the mud and we can clean him up and we can put him in a dress and put some earrings on him, but turn him loose and his nature will run back to the water. He must have a new heart. He must be born again. So the answer is yes. He is a voluntary participation with his unconverted nature. Now my question is, First Corinthians fifteen twenty two. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be alive. That sounds like W imputation to me. So I'd be curious to know how that you would explain that as not being an imputation of sin to Adam, then an imputation of God's righteousness back to us. Well, sure. Uh, as in Adam all sin, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Well, you know, all are not made alive. It wasn't automatic. You know, Adam, I quote Romans 5, 12, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression is a figure of him that was to come. You know, through Adam's sin, uh, sin through Adam's sin, uh, sin was brought into the world and man's body became depraved. He became subject to physical death. Uh, but, uh, but not every... Jesus came into the earth and he made righteousness available to all. But you have to choose Jesus to be righteous. All are not righteous. In fact, he quoted it. Romans 3.10, there is none righteous. No, not one. Of course, that's talking about the man without Christ because 2 Corinthians 5.21, he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. If you 1 John 2.29, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that does righteousness is born of God. You have to choose to sin and you have to choose to be righteous. Yeah, these are going to be difficult. So if you have questions for them because of this nature, you need to be writing your questions down and with the audience Q&A. So what we're going to do, move to part two, question number two. Reverse the order. So Barry, you will ask the first question. Mike, you will get the first response. And this will be dealing with question number two, what is necessary for salvation. I guess I would begin with, if man is born innocent, I'm confused, and I'll just make the statement what's the difference between innocence and holiness, but I won't pick that apart. But if man is born innocent, which is in the eyes of God without sin, why is this atonement from Christ even needed at all? Well, we all deserved hell, but God is loving and merciful. And so God made a way whereby man can be forgiven without God uh, lowering his standard of holiness without the government of God uh, being lowered in the eyes of his moral subjects. Uh, God is a merciful God. That's why uh, we, all, we all deserve to go to hell. Not, I mean, if we're all born, you know, saying you're born in sin and, and you deserve hell because you're born, you, you, uh, you deserve hell based on the way you're born, it's the same as saying, well, like he said, can the leopard change his spots? I mean, you deserve to go to hell because uh, you have a birth defect. You deserve to go to hell because uh, uh, the, the color of your skin or, or, or something like that. No, we deserve to go to hell because we were born 
in the image of God with a free will, knowing right from wrong, God, you know, God made an atonement available. He gave us the truth. He gave us a conscience. He gave the Holy Ghost that comes, John 16, 8, to reprove the world of sin and righteousness of judgment. The grace of God that brings salvation to appear to all men. Yet, men refuse. Men choose to rebel and disobey God and suppress the truth. All right. Uh, there's, there, there's been a lot of uh, comments made about self, self-reformation and that we're supposed to preach repentance, but they we're not supposed to tell people to clean up their act. And uh, so I'm, I, I want to know, uh, is it biblical to preach repentance to sinners? Jesus said in Luke 5, 32, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's why Jesus came. He told the church in Luke 24, 47, that repentance and Remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Or are we just supposed to preach Christ? That's a good question. Do we preach repentance? I believe my opening statement on one of the points was that we, just, we agree that the call throughout Scripture is to repent, but what else? Believe. Repentance and faith must go hand in hand. Did Judas repent? It says he's he repented with tears. Did you just go to heaven? Christ called him the son of perdition. What well, was missing? Must be missing something else. What was the second part? He must repent and have faith. Our faith then is not in my repentance or my ability to repent. Paul says, I preach Christ and him crucified. Therefore, I repent and place faith in the work of Christ. Not in my own self-reformation. So yes, we place repentance, but we also preach faith as well. My question, correct? I wanted to follow up because I think I was confused. You, you told me, and I, I've got this wrong, that we were innocent. That's what you say. We're not holy, but we're innocent. No, no, no. Not us. Babies. Oh, yes, yes. Babies are born innocent. Is wait, that... wait, wait. We're on this section now. There's a lot of stuff I want no, to follow up on. I, I, it's my time, man. I'm... I thought it had to be related to the topic. It is. If it's related to the topic, explain if it's related to the topic. And then I want any, any questions to follow up in your... Um, I'm not trying to take your time away. I'm just trying to follow the rules. That's, 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 if that's allowed, then that's fine. But this, show, show how it connects. Yes. This, we're talking about point two, the cross. Is that correct? Yeah. Your answer to my first question was, and I'm responding to your answer to point two. First question. All babies are born innocent, which you said last time. This last time, now I'm tying it together, you said that all deserve hell. How can babies be born innocent and now we all deserve hell? Well, babies are innocent because they don't know right from wrong. They don't have, they don't have their, their conscience developed to the point where they know right from wrong and they can make a choice. All deserve hell, okay, semantical issue. All deserve hell that had the power to choose. You know, if somebody doesn't have the power of choose an innocent baby who knows, uh, who doesn't know good from evil, can't make that choice. But it's all who had the. Ch otherwise, otherwise, if we're born sinners, and I'm not, I don't want to misrepresent and, and, and accuse somebody of believing something that I'm not sure they believe. But if we're all born sinners and babies are sinful and God is holy and just, and a baby dies, then a baby goes to hell. I would, okay. I, I would like Barry to comment on Romans 3.31, which says, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. There it says, faith establishes the law of God. Romans 3.27. What then is boasting? is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. How is the law established? By works? By moral reformation? or by faith 
in what? What is faith necessary for it? In Christ. Christ perfectly fulfills the law. Therefore, the law is established in us when we accept his atonement by faith. I'm going to stay on this topic of babies because uh, I'm still confused. Did Christ's atonement apply let me, let me take a different approach. Did the atonement of the cross apply to all men? And if it applied to all men, then did Christ also die for unbelief? How is it then that men go to hell? Yeah, I'm not, I, I don't understand your question. Yeah, let me, I'm sorry. I, I took a change to talk. Uh, the atonement. Well, that's the next section. I'm sorry. We'll, we'll take to the next section. We'll stay with uh, the cross. Upon well, the cross... the last section are we on the next one? No. The cross? Like we're, on, we're on what is necessary for salvation. What is necessary for salvation. I apologize. I got ahead of myself. What role does the Holy Spirit play, if any, in salvation? What role does the Holy Ghost play in salvation, if any? Well, uh, plays a great role. John 16 8 says, when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The Holy Ghost comes to reprove the world of sin. Make the sinner aware of his sin and see sin the way God sees it. Make him see his need of a Savior. The Bible says in Acts 7 51, Stephen preached the Sanhedrin. He said, ye stiff-necked, and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do you. So the, the Holy Ghost can be yielded to or resisted. Again, Jesus said in Mark 8, 17, Have you your heart yet hardened? Hebrews 3, 7, 8. Where, wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, In the day when you hear His voice, harden not your heart. The Bible says in Acts 19.9, uh, Acts 19.9, when diverse, now this is not talking about believers, when diverse were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, Paul separated, okay? So the Spirit of God comes to convict of sin and John 16.13, how be it, I quote the whole passage about for the sake of time, how be it, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you in all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, he will shew you things to come, he shall glorify me, he shall receive a mind, shall shew it unto you, he comes to reveal Jesus, the sinner's need for his Savior. Your third question. Oh, okay, well, I, you know, I, I, how do, uh, babies are born sinful, and God is holy. How do babies not go to hell? Now, I, I want to clarify. I don't believe babies go to hell. I don't want to be... Is that not to be... That would be on the part. That would be on the part. The other with the work of Jesus on the cross. Well, he's asking me questions about the birth. I was called off down. Okay. What was the question again? I'm sorry, I'll take it. Just you go ahead and do it. Do it. Well, well, I didn't have a third question. That's I didn't have well, a third question, okay. and I thought he asked me questions about the, the babies. We'll move in here. Go ahead. Ask the question. I'm sorry. Is that all right? I mean, yeah, I, it's fine. It's fine. I don't, want to, I don't want to have double rules. No, no, no it's, it's fine. fine. Okay. You can please repeat the question, because I apologize. I, I want to be clear. Okay. If, uh, if, uh, if babies are born sinful, and God is holy, has to judge sin, punish sin, uh, then how do babies not go to hell? What does Scripture say? Nothing. Does the Scripture say anything about babies going to heaven or hell? It does not. The scripture's silent. Does that mean I'm going to be silent? No, I'm not going to be silent. Will not the righteous judge do what's right? That's what I would say, number one. Number two, the, the issue, and this issue that you brought up, good, which is a good issue, the issue is that babies are not born holy, they're born innocent. God 
demands holiness. So you have the same problem that I have. How is it that your baby obtains holiness? We both have the same answer. The only hope that a child has and the only hope that a baby has is the same hope that an adult has, the grace and mercy of God. So if babies go to heaven, they go by virtue of the fact that God is gracious and merciful to them. Uh, I, I believe the scripture does say something on that. Okay, we'll get you back to that another time. <laughs> Alright, so we are in the, in the audience after this question and Q&A. That's the week time for audience questions, so you can get your questions in. I'll ask that you write those on the card. I'll ask those, Kevin. Uh, so we're going to point number three, which is question number three is what is the work of Jesus on the cross? We've kind of crossed that line a little bit. Question number two, that's okay. Uh, once again, we'll have three questions, three responses, two minutes each. Uh, we will go back to the order from the first question, and it'll be Mikey, you ask the first question. Okay? I ask the first question. You ask the first question. All right. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not accusing here. I don't, I don't know. So I'm asking, I'm asking Barry, this seems to be uh, in a lot of his statements here. So I just, uh, did Jesus die for all? John 3.16, that's the verse. And for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that who should believe he should not perish, but have eternal life. So is there a condition there? The condition is belief. But the issue is world. Would we equate world with all? Well, most would. But here's the problem. If Christ died for all, people go to hell. Is Jesus a failure? Does that mean God, from the foundation of the world, planned to redeem the entire world through the work of Christ, and now God has failed? Does that mean Jesus paid for sins that God will punish a second time in hell, and so now we have an unjust judge? Does that mean God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit sat down at the beginning of time, they had a covenant to redeem all the people, but the Holy Spirit was too weak to convert? Does Jesus die for all? Will do all go to heaven? The answer is no. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Jesus says, I died for the sheep, I died for the church. Before the foundation of the world, we are told that God had an elect. Who are the elect? Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, before either was born, knowing good or evil. God had set apart Jacob from ego. Why? Because Jacob was a good man? No, Jacob was a scoundrel and a liar. Was Abraham a good man? Abraham was a liar. Was David a good man? He was an adulterer, a scammer, and a murderer. Shall we go on? Was Moses a good man? Where do we find Noah? Drunk? Where do we find righteous Lot, mentioned in the New Testament, laid up having a, a relationship with his daughters? Did they, so then I ask you, why did they go? Did they go because they were good, or did Jesus pay for their sins? If we have a God that died to pay for the sins of the whole world, we have a failure. How do we define world? This is very important. The context is he's speaking to a Jew. I died, and there is approximately 17, if I'm not mistaken, uses of the word cosmos. So the only one that can apply is that I died for men of every tribe and nation, and not only for you Jews. Moral government theory, if I understand it correctly, is that God demonstrates his wrath against sin upon his son. And I may pose the question, oh, I'm sorry, do you like to protest moral government theory? Huh? Would you like to protest? Yeah, I, yeah, I've never heard that before. Go ahead, though. I'm sorry, I thought you were familiar with the works of Charles Finney and Pelagius. Yeah, I think you're, I think you're oh, informed on that. Okay, well, then I will withdraw my question and I will invite our audience to look that up. Isaiah 53, I'll go back to that, where it says that the iniquity of us all was laid upon him. He was crushed for our iniquities. How is that not substitutionary atonement? Then I say it wasn't, and I, I don't. I'm, I think you. I think you're assuming I believe something that I've never said I believe. Well, then you can correct your. You can present your position. Maybe we're in agreement. Yeah, maybe I didn't understand the question. Substitutionary atonement. Yes, sir. Uh, that Jesus stands as a substitute yeah. in the place of those who were saved. Yeah, I don't believe it was an exact payment, but it was okay, a it was a it was a public 
uh, it was, a, it was a, uh, an act of public justice whereby Jesus atoned for the sins of the whole world. It's funny that, it's funny that you know, in all the other places in 1 John, it, it, the, world, the word world uh, is, is not used the way we apply it in 1 John 2, 2. Uh, uh, you know, beloved, now are we the sons of God. It has not yet appeared. We shall know that when he shall appear, we shall... Uh, Behold what manner love the Father has bestowed us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew him not. So is that, is that, is that the same context as in 1 John 2, 2? Where it's talking about world? He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Not as Cain, who was 1 John 3, 12, not as Cain was of that wicked one and slew his brother, wherefore slew him, because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not my brethren, if the world hates you was that talking about other classes of people not living in that day what was it so uh anyway uh, but uh i'm i'm finished uh is it my question yes your question all right okay jesus didn't die for all right okay i all right so i would like i would like a comment i would like a comment on second peter 2 1 and Hebrews 10.29 of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace for we know him that has said vengeance belongeth unto me I will recompense saith the Lord and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. That talks about people trotting underfoot the Son of God and counting the blood of the covenant that they were sanctified with an unholy thing, doing despite on the Spirit of grace. 2 Peter 2.1 There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So the Bible says here that Jesus bought, he paid for their salvation with his blood, these false teachers that are preaching damnable heresies. Did you want me to address 2 Peter 2.1 or did you want me to address both? Well, I got lost, I'm going to be honest with you, I just got lost. So I'm going to go to 2 Peter 2.1. Okay, the other was Hebrews 10.29. If Jesus didn't die, for, it's simple. If Jesus didn't die for all, how come it says he bought those people? Both of them. What scripture do you want me to deal with? Because I'm going to apologize. I'm just to count my time now because I, I can't follow both of those thoughts. Second Peter 2 1, is that the scripture you want me to address or Hebrews, sir? Because I. Both of them are Hebrews. Well, what was the scripture citation? Pick, pick whichever one you want. I don't remember the scripture citation. You gave about six and I got lost. And I'm sorry. Well, I gave two. Hebrews 10 29. I quoted the passage in context. I got lost. Hebrews 10 29, 2 Peter 2 1. Okay, 2 Peter 2 1. I seem like you're afraid of this. No, I just can't follow all that. Uh, so I'm slow. Therefore, putting aside all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn babies. Well, long... you're in 1 Peter. That's 2 Peter 2 1. I told you I was lost. But false prophets who arose among the people, just as there will also be false prophets among you, who secretly introduced destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing strict destruction of themselves. Many will follow those sensual ways because they, and what sense did Christ buy them? That's what he's asking them. Obviously, they're claiming to be bought by Christ. And they're false prophets. They're liars. Now, the Hebrews was 10, 29. Is that correct? How much severe punishment do you think you will deserve who has trampled under the foot of God and has regarded unclean the blood of the covenant? Vengeance, I will pray the Lord would you justice to his people. They context us in, in verse 26 there. For if, conditional, we go on sinning willingly after we see the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment, the fury of fire. The condition, of course, is if. The question is not, are these same people who lost their salvation and fell away? The question is, were these people ever saved? How will we know? Who are the saved? They will go to heaven. Are you, would you say that the unsaved will go to heaven? Would you say that the saved would go to hell? Is that possible? It's not possible for saved people to go to hell and unsaved people to go to heaven.
Romans 5, 19, For as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Even so, through the obedience of one, the many will be made righteous. Couple that uh, with 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be alive. How do we explain those scriptures in light of the fact that there was no imputation of sin when it says that in Adam all die? And it's through one man's disobedience many were made sinners. Read, read Romans 5.18 and answer that. Romans 5.18 Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. We agree with that, right? I know everybody in here agrees with that. By the offense of one, Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, right? By what Adam did, everybody's condemned. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So, if you're going to use that the way you're using it on the first part, you've got to use it the same way on the second part. All men under justification of life. You know, where it says, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory. Does all mean all there? Does all mean, does all does not mean all in the first part, but it does mean all in the second part? How about this one? Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. Again, what Adam did brought sin into the world. But man chooses to sin. What Jesus did made righteousness and eternal life available to all. But, you, but man has to choose. Okay. Uh, my, final question. my final question. Well... You know, in Hebrews 10, 29, he said they were talking about people that were not saved. So, my, again, my question is, why does it say, uh, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was, this person that's not saved, wherewith the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite under the Spirit of grace. Now I'm confused. Did Jesus die for those people? Or did he not die? You said that those, those people are not saved. I'm speaking of 1 Peter 2, about the damnable heresies. I didn't make the application there in Hebrews. And I said the key word there is if. If this were possible, not when, but if. I don't know how else to explain the word if. Your question. Oh, my final question. I feel very dissatisfied with the last answer because it did not explain to me how all died. And I'm still confused that babies are born innocent and they die. All the same. And that. Well, it doesn't say that. It says, for as in Adam, and your, your, your phrase is, all is all. For in Adam, all die. So I, I'm just dissatisfied. So I guess I would ask to repeat, repeat also. Well, you know, all that sin die. It doesn't say that. It says all die. You're, in, you're inserting the word well, you sin. Well, you said all men are justified unto life. What? Well, what? Well, Okay, Barry, I don't want to be rude and accuse you of saying something you didn't say and misrepresent you. I'm not trying to do that. But I'm just saying, if you're going to take that first part that way, you have to take the second part that way. Okay, that's, that's my point. I guess maybe you've never thought of that or been challenged before. Statement. So Barry, uh, you were the first with the opening statements, is that correct? So Mike, you'll be the first with the closing statements. You have four minutes to be your closing. How are you going to close it out after this? It'll be audience Q&A. So you have four minutes, Mike, and Barry, you have four minutes after Mike.
Well, you know, again, all the references to all are not just in the epistles. Uh, Acts 17.30 is not an epistle. And Paul was not preaching to the church when he was at Mars Hill. Acts 17.30 says, The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. Whether he has given assurance unto all men that he has raised him from the dead. So how are, going to men, how are men going to have an assurance unless they know that he raised Jesus from the dead for all men? Acts 3.26 uh, is not, is not an, uh, an epistle to the church. Uh, John 1.29 is not an epistle to the church. Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Uh, you know... Can grace be resisted? Well, the Bible's clear that it can be resisted. That, that, that's, first off, in, in Rome, uh, Hebrews 10.29, they, 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 they did despite under the spirit of grace. Paul says in, uh, Paul says in uh, 2 Corinthians 6.1, uh, We therefore as labors together with God, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain, Hebrews 12, 14, and 15. Follow peace with all men in holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. Stephen said in Acts 7, 51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Your fathers did so to ye. Well, Acts 6, 10, the chapter before that says they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. They heard what he said. But they couldn't resist the truth of what he was saying. But yet, they suppressed it. They rejected it. If, if man is not free to repent, God's a tyrant for commanding men to repent that have no ability to repent. That God predestined for his glory that they would go to hell. You know, was the Apostle Paul wrong when he said in Romans 10.1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved? That was the desire of Paul's heart. Yet, we know most Israel was not saved. If God, if Jesus didn't die for all and man is dead, man has to wait on God to regenerate him, then God could have saved all, but he chose not to. However, over and over in the scriptures, we see this all. Uh, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2.4 For there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. You know, oh, that's in an epistle. So the epistle doesn't instruct believers on their responsibility to reach the world. And I know you all believe in an evangel, at least you you say you do, and I don't want to say you don't. The Bible says in the Bible says in First uh, Timothy four ten. Therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. Second Peter three nine. The Lord is not slack concerning His promises; some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, who are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, if it's will that all men be saved. If it's will that none perish but that all repent and most don't repent, I'll ask you the question. Uh, was Jesus a failure? Was his blood not sufficient? Or does some of this depend on man's free will to receive what Jesus did or to reject what Jesus did? Who is the author and finisher of my faith? Is it me? What does Scripture say? Christ. He is the author and finisher of my faith. He that began a good work in me. Was it me? Or was it he that began a good work that will keep me? Romans 9. We have the situation of Jacob and Esau. Jacob have I loved Esau I hated before they did anything. And then the argument is that is, well, that's not fair. Well, what shall we say then? Is there no injustice with God? May it never be. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. The assumption is that we deserve mercy. That's the assumption. The assumption is that babies are innocent and good, and that they deserve, that God owes them all salvation. 
You, you could protest that God would predestinate men to hell. I protest because you have not a God that will not predestinate to save one man. Your God simply opens the door, sits there with his hands ringing, going, Oh, gee, workers, I hope that they will exercise their free will and come in. He has no intention to save anyone. He just leaves it up to them. I have a God that is a sure God. That everything he sets out to do, he will accomplish in his perfect will. There's not one maverick molecule in this universe that can go against his will. I have that kind of God. And if I didn't have that kind of God, I wouldn't even bother praying. Why would I depend upon God to provide me air, water, and breath, and beg for his healing when I need it, if I cannot depend upon him to save me and keep me saved? If I have to depend upon my own flesh. And that's the exact argument of Romans 9. He will harden, says who he will harden. And he will have mercy upon who he will have mercy. And he owes no man nothing. But every man owes him obedience. Every man owes him love. Every man owes him worship. And he owes man nothing. He would be just if he created nothing. A just God would have came down from heaven at the Garden of Eden and he would have watered the whole thing up and thrown it away and damned it all to hell. That would have been justice. But he's, not a good, but he's not only a just God. He is also a merciful God. And in that, he saw that he would provide salvation for some. Versus a God who provides salvation for none, but leaves it in their own hands. I am not saved by my works. I did not reform myself. I was dead in trespasses of sin. The scripture says that I was at enmity with God. I was waging war against God every day. The scripture says I hated Him, is what the scripture says. And so it says of you. And so I did not reform myself because quite frankly I was doing fine. Thank you very much. In my own life and in my own way, I was doing exactly what I wanted to do. And then this little God threw me out of life preserve and said, won't you come to me? No, he didn't, because I was at war with him. And I would not come with him, and I could not come with him. The scripture says I hated him. But by grace through faith have you been saved. Not of, not of works, lest any man should boast. If I am the purveyor of my own salvation, if I walk through the door, if I accepted the all glory to man. Does that sound right? No. All glory to God. Will not the righteous judge do right? He will harden who he will have hardened. And the amazing thing is not that he has predestined any to be saved. The amazing thing is that he would have mercy on one. A whole world full of people that leave the womb, born in iniquity. I was conceived in iniquity. Going from the womb as liars. All shaking their fists. All at any with him. And yet, he tolerates them daily. He provides for them daily. The, righteous, the rain falls upon the righteous and unrighteous. And he chooses to save some. All right. If there's any audience questions, you need to get some. Uh, I'll just ask this one. I don't see that these are addressed to any specific... I see one addressed to a specific person, okay? The rest, I guess, will be general questions both of you will have a response to, okay? All right, so question number one is this. Um, okay. Um, okay, if babies are innocent... I'm going to say this is probably addressed to you, Mike. Okay. Uh, the very... I, I will give you a... a, a chance to um, explain your position on this because this has been a topic of discussion. If babies are innocent, how is it that in Old Testament God ordered death of children of the wicked and that sins of the fathers were visited on children, but most of all, how do they die? Romans 6.23, I guess the implication would be for the wages of sin is death. If babies haven't sinned, why do they die? So, um, Mike, I'll let you, I think that's addressed to you. It's not have your time anymore, but that's addressed to you. And then, Barry, you will have two minutes. Mike, you have two minutes to answer that question. Barry, you'll have two minutes to explain where you actually exist on that question about babies and salvation. Okay. Well, first 
off, Romans 6.23 is not talking about physical death. It's talking about, he's, he's talking about spiritual death. Everybody's going to die. You know, earlier the statement was made that, you know, that I believe because you're holy, you're never going to die. Well, I never said that. I don't believe that. I never said anything to indicate that. Romans 6.23, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's contrasting spiritual death with spiritual life. John 17, 3, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Now, uh, why, why would God, you know, listen, our, our actions affect our society and others around us. You know, it's, it's, it, when, when, when God brought judgment on nations and, and innocent babies who had not sinned because, not because they were good, but because they were innocent, they didn't know right from wrong. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't any merit or evil on their own part, but it's a consequence of other people's disobedience. You know, God promises. God warns people to repent. If you don't repent, judgment will come. And if, people, and, and if judgment comes, uh, you know, if, if, God judges, if God judges America by uh, the Islamics, uh, even if we're here and we're praying for the nation and we're living as best we can and trying to win the lost and everything like that, we're going to bear the consequences of it. And we don't escape that. So, uh, but you know, David said, David said after his child, when, he, when the child died, uh, that, that, that he would go to be with him. So that infers that the child went to heaven. mentioned that. Somebody had a question about that passage, so I want to get that to bear. Okay? So I'm going to bounce off this a question off of that this which was addressed to you, Barry, which bounces off the scripture that Micah used 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 15 through 23. Barry, you said the Bible doesn't speak on babies dying and going to heaven, but what is the meaning of 2 Samuel 12, verses 15 through 23? The question is, did David's child not go to heaven? So, that, that's two minutes. 2 Samuel 12, what? 15, 23? 23. 15 through 23. Well, does it say the baby went to heaven? What does it say? Let me find it quickly here. 2 Samuel 12, 15 through 23. Sorry, I'm lexic. But now he has died. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? Bring him back from where? Is he going to bring him back from heaven? Or is he going to bring him back from the grave? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. There is no mention there in that text whatsoever about an eternal state of that baby. That is what we call presupposition. That is what we call eisegesis. It is taking a position and reading it into the text. The text is unclear. The only thing he can only possibly be talking about that we can assume is his writing. So I'll go there. May I use the remainder of my time? Yes, you have a minute. Original corruption. What is the corruption? Is the mere corruption of the flesh? What did, what did Genesis say? The day that you love, you shall die. Did he die physically that day? That's the argument. It's only a corruption of best. No, he died spiritually. Ephesians 2 1. You were D E A D dead in trespasses and sin. Inability. For therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through men, so death spread to all men. Did that mean they choose it? Is that what it says? It doesn't say men choose to sin. It says that death was spread to them. For as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so through the righteousness of one many will be made righteous. For in Adam, I-A-L-L, -L, our favorite word of this debate, is all die. D, I can't spell it, I-E-D, die, necros. So babies die because they inherit the nature of sin. Now, do babies go to heaven or do babies go to hell? There's not one scripture in there's not one piece of scripture that says that. To say that of this scripture here is what I would call eisegesis. It's reading into the text. The only way that a baby can get to heaven is to be holy. And the only way that he can be holy is through the imputed righteousness of Christ that we talked about there. By one man sin and an end. And so by one man, many are saved. Micah, question addressed to you, Psalm 51.5. Question is, in light of Psalm 
and I am assuming Romans 5.12, I can't really understand that. Um, so Psalm 51.5, Romans 5.12, I think those two. When does one have the power to choose Christ? When does one have the power to choose Christ? Um, I'll give you two minutes. Barry, I'll give you two minutes on that as well. Okay? Well, you know, in Psalm, Psalm 51, a lot of the language in Psalm 51 is figurative. You know, David says in verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Okay, is it, is it hyssop that he's going to purge him? That the, born, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice? Or is bones broken? Uh, or the same thing I brought up with Psalm 58. Is the language figurative? Okay. Now, a lot of things here. David could have very easily been talking about his mother. Uh, there's been case made to show that just a possibility that David was an illegitimate child, which is one reason why when the, when the prophet Samuel came, he says, he said, uh, do you have any others? Well, I got one other out there, but you know, you probably wouldn't be interested in him. And so, uh, David, David doesn't, this is, there's no indication here that says David is talking about himself or that this is literal, unless you take the rest of the psalm literal. someone have the power to choose Christ at any time? Oh, well, when will someone have the power to choose Christ? Or the ability to choose Well, listen, someone has the ability to get saved when they reach the age of accountability, which would vary depending upon the person and their upbringing. But now, I also believe it's not that, it's, it's not that man uh, cannot, but that he will not without the influence and the grace of the Spirit of God and the Holy Ghost. John 16, 8. When He is coming, we'll reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So man can choose, but he will not choose apart from the work of the Spirit of God and the grace of God. But he must yield. Do you need me to repeat the question? I think I'm okay. I mean, if I get lost, I'll have you catch me up. Uh, when does the power have saved? I think the references was there to the Psalms and also Psalms 51 5. Let's start with the Psalm. Is this poetic language? Yes. Is it figurative language? I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Is that figurative? Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Is that figurative? Or is he literally wanting forgiveness of his sins? Most commentators would say that this is David, so I don't know how we could get it's not David. I, don't, I would be interested to know one commentary that says anywhere that this is David's mother. I would, uh, I would like to say that this is, again, eisegesis when he's talking about his brother Samuel said, is there any other? And the, the obvious point is that he's not present, not that he has illegitimate children. Again, I would say that is merely eisegesis, taking a presuppositional view, trying to find some piece of scripture and twisting it without scriptural reference to make it what you want to be. Age of accountability, I would protest, I, and I would challenge at any point in time, to find me in Scripture where it says, at age such and such, this child shall have accountability with me and no right and wrong. Now then, when does man have the ability, was it to choose? The power, the ability to choose Christ. The power to choose Christ. Well, Ephesians, you are born dead, D-E-A-D, -E in trespasses and sin. John 3, when he talked to Nicodemus, and the Spirit, verse 8. John 3, 8. The Holy Spirit blows where it wishes you know what. No what. When God enlightens his heart, what's necessary for salvation? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word. And how shall they hear except there be a preacher? But they are D-E-A-D -E dead, so there must also be an operation of the Holy Spirit. So when God grants the grace of hearing the gospel message, and God grants the grace of the Holy Spirit to enlighten a person, otherwise you have, I would ask you, how are people in the Congo going to be saved because they will never hear the gospel? Question, general questions to both of you. Uh, let Barry go first. Michael, you get the second chance on this one. What does the righteous life of Christ, the actual 33 years on earth, have to do with the salvation of the sinner? <clears throat> Barry, two minutes. 
what does the righteous life of Christ, the 33 years that he lived, have to do, if anything, with the salvation of the Christian? Is that correct? Well, what's the issue? The law. The problem is that all we, like sheep, have gone astray. There is none righteous. There is none who understands. There is none who does good. Someone must fulfill the law. God is a righteous judge and demands that his law be fulfilled. If I am gone astray, if I am one of those who have done nothing good and I have not fulfilled the law, then the law must be fulfilled on my behalf for another. So at the very least, the righteous life of Christ vindicates the law of God for those he would say. The Bible says in First uh, Hebrews 4.15, He was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2.22, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Jesus lived a perfectly holy, obedient, sinless life so that he could offer himself as a sinless, spotless sacrifice for the sins of mankind. He was the spotless lamb. He gave himself, 1 Peter 1.18, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So, so he could offer himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. But, you know, Jesus being God, Jesus being a man, all God and all man, being a free moral agent, Jesus had to obey the law. He wasn't, he wasn't exempt or void from obeying the law. He had to fulfill the law for himself in order to offer himself as a sinless, spotless sacrifice for the sins of the world. Now, if he did all that, why do sinners need to repent? Why do sinners need to obey God? Hebrews, why do, why do Christians need to obey God for that matter? Because the Bible says in Hebrews 5, 9, being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that Obey Him. Jesus Christ is only the Savior of those that obey Him. If somebody's disobeying Him, uh, then He is not their Savior and they're not saved. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, sin is breaking God's commandments. Uh, can you go to heaven and not love Jesus? Jesus said, it, He said in Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. Either they'll hate the one and love the other. If, 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 if you love him, you obey him. You keep his commandments. If you're sinning, you don't love him, you hate him. You're in rebellion against him. 